Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales of Demystified podcast. We're joined by Jason Murring, uh, who is currently a sales operations manager at Cisco Capital. Now, I'm seeing that Jason has over seven years experience kind of in the business and sales ops game, specifically at Cisco Capital. So it's going to be interesting to, to learn about how sales or business ops have evolved during that time. Jason, welcome to the show. Hi, Tom. Thank you. So, Jason, first question, how did you originally move into the sales ops world? I know you had a different role before at Cisco Capital. Yeah, so for several years, I worked with Cisco and Cisco Capital in a consulting type role, um, building uh, mostly uh, systems core to uh, various organizations in, at Cisco. And then eventually, I accepted a role uh, working on a, a, a leasing and lending type system that was being built at Cisco Capital as an analyst. And during my work uh, with Cisco Capital, um, I started to learn the business. Uh, we're in the, in the technology financing business. We provide leases and loans to primarily Cisco's partners, customers. Um, and during, during my, my role as an analyst, I began to do what is now considered some of the classic you know, sales operations type functions uh, for, at the time, the, the sales operations organization. Um, we were working with uh, building some reports and measuring forecasts. Um, we were uh, looking at building and enhancing some of the systems that our salespeople at Cisco Capital were using. And then there was an opportunity to join uh, the organization, formerly the sales ops organization at Cisco Capital. And it looked very exciting. It wasn't so different than what I was doing, um, but it definitely gave me a more breadth and depth of the what we now understand to be sales ops functions. Got it. And what is the current sales tech stack that you're operating? A good question. So I think as a, a lot of sales or ops organizations would say, Salesforce is definitely center to us. Um, so we have uh, our own instance of Salesforce.com. It's separate than Cisco's. Uh, our sales team is much smaller than Cisco's. Um, and so we've really centered most most of what we do around Salesforce, we've tried to adopt more than just the sales cloud offering in Salesforce. We've, we are currently using Einstein analytics for some of our analytic tools. And then the primary applications that our salespeople use to do their, their work, which is uh, pricing and credit type functions. Um, our IT team has very cleverly built those applications so that from the salesperson's perspective, uh, they're fully integrated in Salesforce. They never leave the context of Salesforce. And in fact, the, the, the same exists with our, our customer master, our, our customer database for our customers at Cisco Capital. It's all plugged into Salesforce. And so one of our guiding principles, in fact, is that uh, we want Salesforce to be the single source, the single tool that our sales managers use, as well as our uh, sales uh, individual sellers. So we also use Tableau, which is an analytical, analytical suite that many of you know. Our finance organization currently is responsible for uh, most of the, the functions of the forecast. Uh, even though it's, it's published, um, it's published in Tableau. The, the underlying pipeline data is extracted from Salesforce. We're looking at building out some more um, business intelligence uh, inside Tableau. So that's definitely another tool that uh, we're using. Cisco then provides a whole set of of tools that we use, um, and Cisco uh, has created some of these tools. So I know we're we're talking to each other on Zoom right now, but. The product that Cisco owns is WebEx, so that's certainly used by our salespeople. We have an instant messenger client called Jabber uh, that we use. That's also a Cisco tool. A new tool that's been uh, developed called WebEx Teams. It'll eventually replace Jabber. It's a uh, sort of an instant messenger client, but also a way where you can set up groups where you're broadcasting out a message to a, to a larger audience, but still in the the instant message type um, experience. 
let's see, obviously the office applications, right? And those are always, always included. Yeah. And we're migrating to uh, SharePoint. So we'll be using Microsoft SharePoint as part of our tech stack. Let me think here. Um, so in, the, in our particular, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, carry on, sorry. Okay. Um, so there are some obscure type companies that are involved in some of the calculations due to our, our specific business in calculating lease pricing, but I'm not sure those are so relevant here. Yeah, um, yeah. Yes, but and then there's one not. other one other reporting tool I wanted to mention. Yeah. And uh, it just I lost I lost the train of thought there. So yeah, th those are the basic tools we use. Got it. Um, and just for the audience's benefit, what what is the scale of the Cisco Capital Sales team, and how many people in the Sales Ops team that are supporting those? Yeah, so so um, our sales team is 200 people, approximately, and uh, our sales ops group is our you know, five, just five people. So we're relatively small compared to the hundreds of sales ops type roles on the Cisco side, our, our parent mm -hmm. company. Yeah, I mean, so from collecting data from interviewees, I normally see the ratio between ops to sales rep is 1 to 15, but you guys are currently rocking 1 to 40, it seems like. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a bit about that. How How is the sales team organized and how how do you support them? Do you have like one ops person per 40 reps or like what's the structure? Yeah, so we so we're we're the global sales ops team, and we we don't have an allocation of each of us to any particular group of of people. There are a few individuals around the world that support more of the local geos. They're not technically part of our sales ops uh, organization, but they uh, do serve some sales ops types roles and providing sales related re reporting and and those kinds of of tasks. Um, so we're we're set up where. Um, let's, let's see. So we support the whole world. We divide out our, our geographies into the basic America as Amir and APJC. Um, in the U S there's further segmentation that's by like enterprise commercial service provider, public sector. So we do break it down further, uh, in the United States. Um, our interactions are, we, each of us has a, a different type of role. So we'll have one of our individuals on our team is more technically oriented. We title him as our Salesforce administrator. Um, for some functions, he'll work with our IT group that supports uh, lots of so, uh, several pieces of our work. Um, but he's more technically oriented. He learned the Einstein analytics, uh, analytics suite from Salesforce. Yeah. Um, pretty much on his own. Um, another member of my team is a CPA. Her background is more finance. She worked with Cisco Finance for a long time. Uh, she has has that role. So things that are related to some of the reporting or type accounting type challenges we'll have downstream, she would be assigned to that. Uh, another member has more marketing type experience. So uh, for things related to communications and um, the collateral that we provide to our sales teams, the more sales enablement type function she'll work on. So each of us comes with a different skill set and we, we divide and conquer or contribute to the projects that involve all of us. Got it. And, and which would you say your, your strength is? Which area within sales operations? Uh, me personally or my yeah. organization? Me, yeah, me personally. Okay. I would say that my strength is definitely on the systems and process side. That's, that's my background. Uh, I, I look at making life more efficient, uh, increasing sales productivity. I look at um, survey results from our sellers and then taking those results and try, trying to derive priorities, prioritize projects that will improve their productivity, give them more time with their customers and partners that they work with. And then turning also some of that feedback into specific enhancements into the, the different systems and tools that our sellers use. Got it. And that leads very nicely onto my next question, which was going to be about something you, you guys have done recently to improve the productivity of a single or a number of reps. 
Yeah, let, let's let's see here. Um, trying to think of a, a really good example. Well, we have a, a, a pretty sophisticated system that's related to their basic function, which is pricing leases and loans. Uh, our sales our salespeople, the, the primary system they're in on a daily basis, other than Salesforce, is this tool that we call the pricing workbench. And uh, sometimes uh, there are defects that are noticed, so, some issues there. And, and what we've seen is that um, without careful analysis, some of these defects will, will come up time and time again. So one of the things we've done recently is we've taken a really thorough look at the kinds of defects that are being logged with our IT support teams and, and holding our IT teams accountable for making sure they prioritize the most impactful um, fixes uh, rather than the ones that maybe they, they feel are more necessary to support something that's, that's separate. Uh, we can use the data that we've compiled uh, to make sure that they're working on the ones that will ultimately free up the time and help productivity for our sellers. Got it. This is super interesting, right? So we have like the sales reps here. We have the IT team here. We need the IT team to help the sales reps. But obviously, it, like the sales reps are too busy selling. So they need you guys, like the middleman, to almost represent the sales team to, to make the, the, to prioritize what is pushed through the IT team's workflow. Is, is that right? That's right. I, I probably could have mentioned that before. I mean, we are, we do represent the voice of sales. You know, we will compile. Uh, the feedback from sales, and then be an advocate for sales to the adjacent organizations, primarily IT. We have an operations type organization uh, and, uh, and then also finance. So we, we're the advocates where we liaise with those organizations. Um, we, we provide an important glue sometimes that holds those or brings those organizations together uh, when things need to be discussed and, and resolved. Got it. Yeah, I think we just have our quote. We we pull out one quote per episode, and I think that's the quote we're going to use. Is we we represent the voice of the sales team. Um, awesome. So you mentioned forecasting earlier. Um, did you say that that sits within finance? Yeah, the, I think it's a, a legacy you know decision that was made some time ago. But our finance teams, uh, they which are sort of a separate organization. Um, they uh, run the forecast calls on Mondays with the sales teams, and they consequently they compile the final forecast presentation that's that's presented to the sales managers and sellers on those calls. So so we help the finance teams. We we make sure that they can get the right information. We work with them when they when they want to make improvements to the forecast presentation. Uh, we definitely play a role there, but they're the primary. They're the ones who present it. They're accountable for the forecasting at Cisco Capital. Oh, no, that's quite interesting. I think this is one of the first times where the forecasting has does not sit directly within the sales ops team and sits within finance. Mm -hmm. um, cool. And then next question, and this might be more for your your technical guy, but the data quality within Salesforce, um, does that sit with your team? And what are you currently doing to improve that? <laughs> well, I, I mean, data quality is so important to every organization, every instance of an org for, for Salesforce. Um, we do a variety of things. So first, we can do stuff on our own. On a quarterly basis, we look at, uh, we, we run a series of data quality type reports. We look at, for example, um, null fields. If we find out that we were asking for some piece of information and it's not required and it's very seldomly completed and we don't have a strong business justification for it, then we'll, we'll take it out. Um, also, if it's a required field, if it's something where a required entry by our sellers and we determine that most of the time it's just bogus or it was just a quick, you know, first selection on the list selection, then we'll revisit yeah. and say, hey, what are we really doing with this, this information? Is this the right thing to ask at this point in the process? Is it just something obscure that maybe one uh, group group wanted to measure at some point, but has kind of lost track of, we'll make sure we take it out. So we'll, we'll, we do that on a quarterly basis. We'll run this, these data quality checks. But we also, from our surveys, from our individual, um, you know, small group of sellers that we, we interview, um, we'll come across um, 
their own data quality challenges. Uh, for example, um, they'll find that we, you know they 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 say that they have a, a subset of of a certain kinds of deals that use a certain business model, for example. And they'll say, hey, I know we have 10 or 15 of these, but when, when we run the reports, we only see three. What's going on? And so we'll go and figure out, you know, why there's a discrepancy there. So we'll help in these individual cases. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, we uncover, you know, perhaps a, a moderate to major uh, defect in how data is being transferred from one system to another, and that results in some reporting issues. And, and since we're involved in many of the different systems that our company uses, we identify those and we'll work with the right teams to get those resolved. Got it. Um, also, from, from a data quality, um, I, I like to also say that the collateral, the sales enablement types, materials that we provide to our, our sellers, we, I also consider that part of the quality because in those materials, um, they'll, it'll state some attributes of an offering, for example, from our company. And sometimes, you know, it, those details change soon after they're published. And so what we do is we make sure we go through all of the materials that our salespeople utilize, kind of like a, as a, almost a marketing function, and make sure that that information is correct and updated. And when it's not, we send it back to the, say, correct marketing teams or the product development teams to make sure that that's corrected and republished or handed back to us for republishing so our salespeople always have accurate and quality information. Got it. And that's the first time I've heard that out of 80 interviews, I think, that data quality also mm. includes the collateral that you're giving. Um, penultimate question. Jason, if you had to record just one sales-related metric for the rest of your career, which would you choose? I have been fascinated with the pipeline coverage metric. That is one that I first saw nicely published uh, in one of the templates that Salesforce developed as part of their Einstein solution. And what it is, is that um, the way to calculate that is you first, you, you start with your quota and then you reduce that quota by the amount of closed business. So you have your remaining quota and then you select the different forecast categories um, that you want it to consider uh, as part of your pipeline. And you measure then the ratio of how much pipeline you have to close your remaining quota. To me, it's a very powerful metric because um, in the beginning of, the, of a fiscal period, you may want to include very broad you know, pipelines. So, you, so in Salesforce, it would be you know, the, the pipeline forecast category plus commit in best case. But as the quarter, uh, as you move into the fiscal period, say the, uh, the quarter, uh, you start... Uh, getting more specific. And maybe towards the end, I only want to see what my committed opportunities, the aggregate of my committed opportunities are to my remaining quota. And that gives the sales managers um, a pretty good, pretty good idea about the, how likely they are based on their pipeline to hit their quotas. Interesting. Okay. So this is looking at, well, it's basically giving you a snapshot as to how likely you are to to close based on how much you have at different stages through the pipeline. But let's say you're measuring this six months out from the end of the financial year, you're going to open up more stages in the pipeline in order to do this calculation because you know you have more time. And then That's if you're right. measuring it That's right. one month out, okay, got it. Um, you want to you want to narrow the focus on just, just those committed opportunities. Um, and then what well, we haven't done yet, but what I plan to do is, we can look at the history when your 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 um, your uh, um, your pipeline metric is is like this a certain value. Um, you can predict then. You know, will I reach my quota? Should I focus my time and effort on building the pipeline really quickly if it's early enough? Is that where I should tell my salespeople to go focus, or should they really focus on those opportunities that are you know and say in the best case upside? Uh, and try to get those to commit or, or get closed. So it gives the managers uh, a key insight into how they want to direct their sales teams. Got it. Awesome. And then a final question, who in the world of sales operations has uh, inspired or educated you the most? 
Who in the world? So do you mean other, like other companies or other leaders that I've heard speak? Uh, yeah, so normally individuals within sales operations. Hmm. Well, I've been inspired by, by some of the individuals in our, our parent company, Cisco, that are in the, the sales ops roles. Uh, for them, they have so many more team members that they're able to have some individuals dedicated to more <laughs> the philosophy of the organization, to the deep, you know, the deep thinking, um, planning strategy that they're just, you know, there's a lot more people that are removed from the tactical work so they can do that thinking work. And, and they've come up with some great ideas. They're able to move fast. Um, I, I've also, I have really enjoyed some of the, the sessions that I've seen in the sales ops domain from Dreamforce, which my entire team attends every year and has for the last six, six years or so. And uh, I mean, some, some of those sessions by ranging from the academic, like Forrester and IDC type uh, presenters all, all the way to the Salesforce employees showcasing, hey, if you have a sales ops organization, here's something that's particularly interesting to you. So I know that might be a little bit broad there, but not specific to any individuals, but definitely some Salesforce and our, and our parent company has, has given us some inspiration. Oh, awesome. That is absolutely fine. Um, okay, Jason, I'm going to pick out a few things I particularly enjoyed. I have two pages of notes here. Um, the Your view of keeping Salesforce as the absolute single source of truth and plugging in as much as you can into Salesforce, I think is good because obviously it gives you like the Bible of, of where you are with all of your customer data, but also it's probably making your salespeople more productive because they'd have to flip over here to do one thing and then come back um, to do another. Right. Your quote, at, well, your, your, your philosophy almost about how your team is representing the sales team and you're the voice. And then finally, this, um, the point I never heard about with data quality also applying to the, the data or the information that you're giving your reps as they go out selling and all the capital that you're giving. Um, so Jason, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for having me.